great to have all of you here today. In the Gospel of Luke, the doctor, chapter 24, the guy who could understand life and death, the guy who knew what it was to check somebody's pulse and find out if they were living or not, the one who was well-educated, wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he wrote in verses 24, 1 through 9, these words about that first Easter morning. He said, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, that describes the crowd here right before you all. <laughs> the women took the spices that they had prepared and they went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away. But when they entered, they did not find the body of Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. And in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. Now if I were there, I would probably be saying, Well, where is he then? And they gave the answer to why he wasn't there. They said, He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And then they remembered his words. And when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. I want you to notice the progression of activities that day with those who showed up that Easter morning. They prepared. I think it's a good thing to always prepare for Easter morning. Number two, they entered. You've done that today, sometime with trepidation, trying to find a place to sit. Then they wandered. I think that's a good thing for us to do when we're confronted with Jesus Christ, is to wonder about who He is and what He's done. And then they remembered His words. It's good for us to remember what God has said to us. And then they went out and told everybody what they saw and learned that day. And here's my question for you as we go through this morning. Where are you in that progression of events? Did you come prepared? It's not too late if you haven't. Will you sit and wonder today about this Jesus who Easter is all about? Will you remember his words and what he said to you? And when you leave here today, are you prepared to tell others all the things that have happened to you because of Easter Sunday morning? He's risen, and the choir is going to tell us he's risen today. Sound great. Welcome this morning, and happy Easter. It is great to have you here today. I did a little experiment this week. Um, it actually started quite by accident, but I was in the grocery store, and uh, the clerk took care of the the stuff at the checkout stand, and when I got ready to leave, uh, I turned and I looked at them and I said, have a happy Easter, guys. And they just stared at me. They didn't know what to say. And finally one guy said, oh yeah, happy Easter. And so that became a practice in all week, everywhere I went. And anytime I said goodbye to somebody, I just said happy Easter. And everybody stalled on a response. Nobody quickly just said, well, happy Easter to you too. They had to think about it. See, Merry Christmas is easy. Happy Easter is another story. And yet, I didn't find any. Everybody said it back once they thought about it. Oh, yeah. So try it today. All right, wherever you go, whatever you're doing, you get out of there, just say Happy Easter. See what folks do. I would love to hear the story. But Happy Easter here at New Hope. It's great to have you with us. There are always folks who visit on Easter Sunday, and we are so pleased to have you with us. I'm going to ask you to do something that you hate to do. I'm going to ask you to fill out a Vista card. They're in the pew in front of you. Ask somebody to hand you one if you can't reach one. We would love to know that you were here today. Here's a promise we make at New Hope. We will not beat on your door. We will not bother you on the phone. We will not pester you in any way except send you something in the mail next week that lets you know what goes on around New Hope the rest of the year. Gives you a little introduction about who we are and what our, our purpose and we believe our meaning in this community is. And we would love to put that information in your hand. We will not bother you in any other way unless you request to be bothered. And then we have some folks who can do that very, very well around here. And we would be so obliged to do so. Uh, we're really keeping uh, announcements and prayer requests today uh, to a minimum. We're focusing our attention today on, uh, on the fact that Jesus Christ is risen. 
So the only announcement I want to make is next Sunday night after the rodeo is over, all right, at 6.30 here at the church, we are going to see the movie, 50-minute movie called Journey to Jamaa. It has been part of our small group study for the last month. It's been part of the sermon series uh, over the past month. And whether you're in a small group or not, and all the small group folks, we can come and watch the movie from beginning to win in its entirety and then talk a little bit about that. So that's this coming Sunday night at 6.30. We hope that you will come and join us. I also have to briefly tell you about yesterday. Uh, you guys have your work cut out for you, this, this service. Uh, my Easter was yesterday. I had the opportunity to, uh, to go to the men's prison in Chowchilla, along with uh, Francis Chan, some of you might recognize that name, Joe Avila from our church who put on the event with Operation Starting Line, uh, Fred and Della and several others. And uh, we did two yard events. Probably 800 to 1,000 men attended these two yard events. And over 180 men gave their life to Jesus Christ yesterday. And uh, some folks are going to say, yeah, those are just jailhouse conversions. Hey, don't forget, Paul spent time in jail. Okay? Uh, don't forget Joe Abel of our church found Christ because of jail. Don't forget Rick, who's sitting back there, found Christ because of jail. Francis laid it out. He said, I, I don't want your responses if this is just so you can get some better benefits while you're in prison. This is about whether you're going to let God create a church behind prison walls. To me, it's the Urban uh, Ministry Institute is being taught at that prison. It's teaching men seminary level classes so they can become the pastors inside prison walls. Lifers are taking this class. Men who will never get out of prison and their purpose and meaning of life now is to become the pastor to the church behind the walls. I was so impressed yesterday. I felt like God was saying, Tim, if California has a chance for renewal and revival, if California has a chance to become a godly state again, it will not be from our politicians. <laughs> they have proven that. And it's probably not going to be through our large churches. Tim, I think revival is going to break out because of what I am going to be allowed to do behind prison walls. And guys, my challenge to you in this Easter service today is let's not just let it be the movement of God behind prison walls, but let it be God's movement in our hearts today here. And together with our brothers and our sisters behind prison walls, Let's become the men and women that God uses in the 21st century like he used in the 1st century to turn the world upside down. It wasn't a political movement. It wasn't an army. It was men and women who said yes to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I hope it can start for us right here today. I'm so glad you're with us. Our ushers are going to come wait on us this morning as we have our morning tithes and offering. You're going to have an offertory, and after that, the musical and the message will, will be the rest of our service today. Thank you so much for coming. You delight us with your presence. Our Father, we love you and we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus. Folks are gathering like this literally all around the world. Every nation, every language, every tongue and tribe are gathered this Easter morning. And they are gathering for one reason and one reason alone, and that is because... 2,000 years ago, God the Son rose from the dead. The world thought they had quieted Jesus when they buried Him in a tomb. But they forgot. They forgot to remember that Jesus said, in three days, I'll be raised to life. And for 2,000 years, the world has celebrated this singular event in history. Thank you for the privilege that is ours to share in this today. Father, thank you for the privilege of giving and sharing. Giving for the purpose so we can share. Thank you for the choir and all the work they've done. Thank you for the instrumentalists and the talent that they express. But thank you all, Father, most of all, for your presence in our midst to do a work in our lives that will not only change us, but, Father, I pray you will use us to change the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Words that most of you know. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he willingly gave up his only begotten and unique son. For what purpose? So that whoever, anyone and everybody that would believe in 
and trust in and cling to and rely upon his dear son that we would not perish. We would not come to destruction. We would not be forever lost. But instead, we could have everlasting life. God says he loves us. As most of us in this room know, love must be more than just talk. God said, and then Jesus did. Have you ever in a relationship had a reason to doubt somebody's love? When doubt is present, love is diminished. But when love abounds, doubt is destroyed. God, on crucifixion day, proved what he said. He loves us. And on resurrection morning, he demonstrated his power that that love would be forever. For you see, God's love was settled once and for all at the cross. Let's listen as they sing about that. I hope things have been settled at the cross for you. If not, this would be a grand day for you to make that decision. Paul wrote in the letter to the Philippians in chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, these words. He said, Therefore God has exalted Him, Christ Jesus, and He's freely bestowed upon Him the name that at every knee should bow at its mention. The name of Jesus, every knee should be humbled in heaven and on earth and under the earth. The sign at the top of the cross that first Easter that Pilate had carved and placed there, Jesus, King of the Jews, and he had it done in multiple languages. That sign was a sign of derision and mockery at Christ and towards those who were his followers at the time. If you arrived early enough today before, uh, before the screen came down, you saw our three crosses. And at the top of that center cross was a sign, Jesus, King of the Jews. Our sign today was not intended to be a sign of derision or mockery, but instead it was done to be a sign of honor and worship. Both attitudes, I'm confident, are probably present here in this room. There are some folks who still mock Jesus and deride his followers. Some, like many of you, though, by faith believe that Jesus once and for all settled the matters about our sin, about our death, about our love, about our life, and he did it at the cross. And we humbly today, we humbly bow expressing to him honor and worship which one are you today? Which, which sign, the one 2,000 years ago or the sign today, would best indicate the attitude of your heart towards Christ? There is going to be a day in all of our futures that every single one of us in this room, there is a day coming that every one of us will bow a knee and say, Jesus is Lord. Some of us will do it freely as we've done today. Those of you who choose not to do it freely on that day, it will be done forcefully. The force of conviction, the force of regret, the force of frustration, the force of the realization of lost opportunities. But one day, all of us will bow and acknowledge that Jesus is exactly who he said he was. He is the Lord Most High. Paul wrote in the book of Romans chapter 5, he said, you see, at just the right time, is this your right time today? At just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anybody die for a righteous person, though for a good person, somebody might possibly dare to die. But God, he demonstrated his love towards us while we were still sinners. His son died for us. Since we have now been justified, how? By the shedding of his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through his life? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to him by the death of Christ, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this true, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now been reconciled, united, restored. I don't know if you're aware of it, but in this country of the United States of America, there is a great divide. 
And I'm not talking about Republicans and Democrats. I'm not talking about liberals and conservatives. Now, there's a real physical divide. It's called the continental divide. The divide determines whether the river, where the rivers flow and where their final destination is. There's also a faith divide. This faith divide determines which way our life flows. And it also determines where our eternity ends. There's a story that Jesus told of a rich man and a beggar. It's a fascinating story. In their life on this earth, there was this huge economic divide between rich and poor. Between these two men, there was a relational disconnect. The rich man wanted nothing to do with Lazarus. After their deaths, the Bible says that in their places of destiny, one ended up in a place of torment. One ended up in the place of blessing. The rich man, torment. The poor man, blessing. Not because one was rich and one was poor, but because one had faith and one rejected it. And it says there was this great gulf between the two and it was fixed. And I just lost a bracelet. That, that was not in the Bible. All right. The rich man in his agony looked over at Lazarus in his joy. And he said, Lazarus, could you come put some water on my tongue to ease my suffering? And Abraham, who was there with Lazarus, said to the rich man, he can't. He can't. There's a great divide between the two. As much as Lazarus would have liked to, he couldn't because he could not cross that great divide. Our sinfulness and God's righteousness has a great divide between us. But God, unlike that rich man, he is rich in mercy and his grace and his love, and he has provided a bridge so that you and I can cross this great divide. And, and what is that bridge? That bridge is the cross to get across the divide. That's what Jesus has done for us at Easter. The writers of this next song that you're going to listen to, they wrote it, I believe, originally as the bridge to cross the Great Divide. But when somebody was typing up the song, they made a typo. And in the chorus, they switched those two words around. So instead of it just being a bridge to cross the Great Divide, the chorus says, the cross that bridges the Great Divide. Sometimes out of our errors, God does great things the bridge, and the cross to get us from earth to heaven, from sinfulness to saintliness. Let's listen as they sing to us about the cross to bridge our great divide. The message of every single one of those songs was powerful. Why don't you give it up once again for the Easter Choir at New Hope this year. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. How about the brass group over here? Great job, guys. Good job. And ladies. And ladies. Great job. One of the characters out of the Easter story, little known and yet also very pertinent, was a fellow by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. He was a very wealthy Pharisee. He was a member of the council. And at that moment, he was a secret follower of Jesus Christ. And it was Joseph who went to Pilate and ask if he could have the body of Jesus after the crucifixion. And it was Joseph who supplied the tomb for Jesus to be buried in. It seems that somebody pulled Joseph aside and said, Joseph, it is such a beautiful, costly, hand-carved tomb. Why on earth did you give it to somebody else to be buried in? And Joseph just smiled and said, why not? He only needed it for the weekend. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And aren't we glad he only needed it? for the weekend. Several years ago, in a town called Oshawa, Ontario, Canada, George and Vera Bajinski, their lives were changed forever. The date, February 16th, 1989. It was a very normal Thursday morning. The phone rang at 9.15 a.m. The voice on the other end said, there's been an accident. It involves your son, Ben. 
as they approached the intersection of Adeline and Simcoe Streets near the young man's high school. They could see the flashing lights of the police cars, the ambulance units that were there. Vera noticed a photographer and she followed the direction of his camera lens to the largest pool of blood that she had ever seen in her life. All she could muster to say to her husband was George. George, Ben's gone home to our Heavenly Father. Her first reaction was to want to jump out of the car and somehow collect all the blood and put it back into her son. That blood for me, she said, at that moment, it became the most precious thing in the world because it was his life. It was life-giving blood, and it belonged to my son. He was my only son, and I loved him so much. The road was dirty, and my son's blood didn't belong there. George, the dad, noticed that cars driving through the intersection were driving right through the blood of his son. His heart was broken. He wanted to take his coat off and cover the blood and cry out, You will not drive through the blood of my son. It was on that evening that Vera understood for the first time in her life one of God's greatest and most beautiful truths, the blood of Christ. Because it was the strongest language that God could have used. It was the most precious thing that he could give. It was the highest price that he could pay. And through God's amazing love, you and I have the opportunity to be redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, it gives us a warning. It says, do not treat the blood and the sacrifice of Christ lightly. Otherwise, it is like trampling underfoot the blood of Jesus Christ. It would be how George felt that day. They're driving through the blood of my son. Charles Wesley put pen to paper years ago, and he described it this way. He said, amazing love, how can it be that though my God would die for me? Over the next couple of minutes, my prayer is that I do not offend anybody. It is not my goal. In fact, in the next few minutes, what I really want to do is let many of you off the hook. And what I hope by the time we come to a conclusion that the two or three or four or five of you that were intended for this day to be a significant day in your life, that God's message would find your heart. You see, if you're a regular at New Hope, I, I, I hope you'll be encouraged and I hope you've been challenged by today's service already and I hope you will even be in this message. But, but folks, that's the minimal desire we have every single week here. But I must confess that on this Easter Sunday, you folks are not my target audience. All I want to say to you is, folks, don't settle for a quantity of life in your relationship with Christ. Accept the quality of life that Jesus offers to every one of us. Don't just invite Christ in your life so that you've got fire insurance and you know when you die, you get to go to heaven. God has so much more for you on a regular basis. And God proved that to me yesterday i got to tell you, on Thursday of this week, I did not want to go to prison on Saturday. It was a full week, and there was lots still we have to do. I wasn't happy with this morning's sermon, and I just wanted to do that. And yet I'd committed to going. And oh, man, am I so glad I did not get distracted from God's purpose in my life. And I wonder how many of us get distracted by the things of this world that we fail in seeing God's purpose and meaning be accomplished in our life. Don't misunderstand me. It's great to have nice families and nice homes and a great job. Wouldn't trade, wouldn't trade those things in my life. Unless there wasn't meaning and purpose and value. And then I would gladly give up all of those to find what it is that God desires to do in me and you. So if you're a regular, take a nap. <laughs> Quick question before me. You cold yet? Okay, turn off the outside coolers. 
outside coolers. Leave the inside ones on. Okay. Because you don't sleep very well when it's cold. <laughs> if you are present because somebody drug you here today with the promise of Easter brunch or lunch, <laughs> or if you were guilted into coming because they came to your kid's piano recital and you are just doing time and you can't wait for the service to be over, then, then guys, let me let you off the hook. You're not the target of God's message today. You didn't come prepared. If you are here and you do not believe in the events of Easter and you reject the idea of a personal God, then guys, sit back and relax. You're not the target of today's message. Because you see, there's no way in the next 15 or 20 minutes that I can persuade you with all of the authentic historicity. I could not convince you with the 300 plus fulfilled prophecies. I could not convince you with the over 500 eyewitness testimonies that never ever changed. I could, I, I could not change your mind with the stories of brilliant, popular, famous, influential people who over the last 2,000 years have been believers in the miracle of Easter and the transforming power of God's gospel message. I just couldn't succeed in that today, so take a break. If you are here today and you are looking for just enough religion to ease your conscience but not enough to change your life, then rest easy. The message today is not for you. You see, this message is not for the casual, the comfortable, or the complacent. So some of you are saying, and what in the heck am I doing here for then? I mean, who's left to be interested in being interested in what you have to say? I'll be very honest. I'm looking. I'm hoping that Jesus is looking through my eyes to you for that one, two, three, maybe more who came today prepared for this day to be a difference maker in their lives. For this to be a turning point, a real change. Let, let me tell you who I'm interested in, who I'm looking for today. I'm interested in the genuinely curious. For those of you who are curious, there is something about Jesus that just gets your curiosity up. There's something that every time you hear his name, every time you go to church, Christmas, Easter, wedding, funeral. There, there is something tingling in you of hope that runs down your spine as you contemplate the name and the life of Jesus. Then there is just something about his life. But here's what I want for you who are genuinely curious. I want you to move from curious to captivated. I want you today to put the titty runners on your soul. And I want you to run to Jesus as fast as you can. I don't want you to hold back one day longer. Let your curiosity cause you to run to him. I remember the first time I saw the Grand Canyon. When they let me out of the car, I ran to the rim. I think I scared a few folks around there. I think they thought I wasn't going to stop before I got to the edge. But I ran. I wanted to see. When the first time somebody laid on a, eyes on a grizzly bear and I heard him say, there he is. I ran. Not to the grizzly bear, but to the sight where they were seeing the grizzly bear. Today, I want you to move from the casual to the, cur the curious to the captivated as fast as you can. I want you to stop saying, oh, I've got time to do that later. When I'm a little older, when I've sowed enough of my wild oats, when I've explored some other things, I want you to do it now. Do you understand the urgency? Now, not later, because you don't know when you may be a bin. You don't know. Do a favor with me. This was an exercise done in prison yesterday. I want all of you to take as big a breath as you possibly can. On the count of three, we're going to just breathe in as big as we can. All right? Are you ready? One, two, three. Let it out. Just got cold in here. <laughs> no. Do you guys realize something? God who lets you do that. The scripture says it is by the word of his mouth that all things are held together. Do you realize one of these times in the middle of a breath you will not finish it in this world. I've known men, I've known preachers who have died in the pulpit preaching. 
If I were to die at the end of this service, do you think it's really going to matter to me if you liked this sermon? Do you know what's going to matter to me at that moment? What's going to matter to me is when I stand in the presence of God and he says, with your last breath, you screwed up. Or if he says to me, with your last words, you said everything I wanted you to say. You did everything I wanted you to do. I want to hear the words, well done, not for my benefit. I want to hear, well done, because of my relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're genuinely curious, move to Captivated today. I, I'm interested in the genuinely concerned. Those of you who, who are here and it's easy for you to believe in the babe of Bethlehem. I mean, after all, that's Christmas, right? Easy to believe in the Jesus who was born. It's easy for me to believe in this Christ child who confounded priests at the age of 12. He was a marvel. I, I believe that, that Jesus is the Messiah who fil fulfilled hundreds of prophecies in his life. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. Your people who believe in Jesus, that he was the suffering Savior who prayed until he sweat blood. You believe that he was betrayed by his closest friends. You believe that he was bruised, beaten, and ridiculed, and never once opened up his mouth in his own defense. You believe the stories of his crucifixion, his death on the cross. You believe that he spent three nights in a borrowed tomb and he rose again on the third day. You've heard, read, and accepted the stories of a Heavenly Father who so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. You are concerned genuinely about your own life, your own death, and your own destiny. But for one reason or another, you have na never made the step from believing the stories to trusting the Savior. Then trust Him today. I'm interested in you. I want you to stop flirting with Jesus. Were you a flirt in school? Or did you marry the flirt? Okay. Flirts rarely make commitments. They just flirt. And those who are genuinely concerned but never trust, you're just flirting with Jesus. And I'm ready to ask you point blank at this moment, why not today make a commitment? Why not today invite Jesus Christ to come live in your life? Let this be the day of your salvation. I'm also interested in you today if you are here and you are genuinely critical. If you're a complainer, I'm, I'm interested in you. Anybody want to admit that you're critical? Anybody want to admit that you're married? No, no, I mean, never mind. <clears throat> you see, we tend to criticize because as long as we are critical of others, we do not have to be committed. As long as we see the flaws in church, and folks, there are plenty. As long as you see the flaws in pastors, i got enough to go around. As long as you see the flaws in other Christians, and I will admit there is no shortage of things to criticize, but as long as you focus on the flaws and the failures of others, you have convinced yourself that you don't need to deal with your flaws and your sins. I'm prepared to ask you today, stop grumbling about the failure of others. Stop measuring your goodness to other people's badness. See, as long as we think we're a little bit better than somebody else, then I really don't have to deal with what my issues are. By the way, we have a program for that. It's on Thursday night. It's called Celebrate Recovery. <laughs> How to get over your hurts, your habits, your hang-ups, not somebody else's, yours. But I'm going to ask you to confess your own sins to a God who loves you, who cares for you, who forgives you, who wants to restore you. I want you to stop hanging out on the fringe, and I want you to get in the mix. Number four, I'm interested in those who are genuinely crushed. You have been crushed by the weight of frustration and failure and fear. You have been crushed by the hurts of broken relationships and broken promises. You have been crushed by the expectations that were unmet and unrealistic. You have been crushed by the circumstances of poor health and even poor finances. You have been crushed by the burden of untimely deaths and unexplainable losses. Last but not least, you have been crushed by the weight of religion. And what is the weight of religion? That is the burden of trying to be good enough and failing every single time. And today I want you to come to a Savior who is good enough for us all. 
leave religion behind and embrace Jesus Christ, the one who says, come to me, if you are crushed under the weight of the pressures of this world, come to me. And he said, I will give you, oh, it's a word, don't we love? Rest for your soul, for your soul. If you're crushed. You see, Jesus offers rest because he took the crushing for us. Do you remember the night before he was crucified on his knees in a garden? The Bible says Jesus prayed until what happened? Blood popped out of sweat on his face. Why was he praying? Father, I know what's ahead. I don't like it. I don't want it. You're my daddy and you can do anything. When your children ask you, Dad, to help them with something, and they bait the hook with, Dad, you can do anything. And they plead with you to get something horrible out of their life. It's tough for us to say no, isn't it? Even if we know it's the best thing we can do, it's tough to say no. And, and you know what Jesus' father said? He said, no, son. I can't take this cup of bitterness away from you you must be crushed so that I can offer to the folks at New Hope Community Church on Easter Sunday morning 2014 so I can offer to them rest. And Jesus said, okay, Papa, not my desires, but your will be done. Last of all, I'm interested in those who are here who are genuinely confused. See, religion is confusing, isn't it? Yet new religions are created every year and old ones kind of tend to keep growing. But I, I don't want you to be confused about religion. What I don't want you to be confused about is a relationship with God. But don't allow confusion to stop you from having a relationship with Him. Let me give you a few examples. Do politics confuse any of you? And yet you still vote every year, don't you? Or you pay your taxes. Or you get your tax and money back. Uh, anybody send you the check back because you don't understand it? <laughs> Not me. Relationships, they're rather confusing, aren't they? I mean, have you ever been in a relationship that didn't get confusing at some time or another? Yet people still go on dates. People still sign up for dating sites. People are still getting married. And yet we don't understand all there is. How about computers and smartphones? Do, how many of you understand really how they work? I know there's a few of you geniuses in here. But I don't. And yet we keep buying them. So why do we allow ourselves to be complacent? Because we cannot answer all the questions about Jesus Christ. Illustration. I often ask couples who are getting married, why do you love each other? Here's one of the most frequent answers I get. I don't know. I just do. So why is that good enough for marriage but not powerful enough for a faith relationship with Jesus Christ? Somehow that we think an unexplainable God must be explainable or I cannot have a relationship with Him. Do you remember the prayer of one man in the New Testament? Lord, I believe. Then what was the rest of the prayer? Now help my unbelief. God, I'm a little confused about this relationship. I believe this, this, and this. I struggle with some of the other. Could you help me out here? And God says, yes, I will. Yes, I will. I offer to you Jesus today. By faith, enter into a relationship with him. So to the curious and the concerned, to the critical, the crushed, and the confused, here is what I'm asking you to believe in, and here's what I'm asking you to choose today. I'm asking you to believe that the birth of Jesus was miraculous in his nature. Earthly mother, heavenly father. And the father of Jesus can be your father before you leave here today. Number two, I'm asking you to believe that the life of Jesus was exemplary in its dependence. Jesus said, everything you see me do and everything you hear me say, it is my Father in me who does it. And as my Father sent me into the world, I now want to send you into the world. 
For my Father sent me into the world with everything that He is to accomplish everything that He desired so that I could be everything that He wanted. And I will now send you into the world with everything that I am, all of Jesus, in me for everything that I need. For what purpose? So that I, with the power of Christ in me, can accomplish His purpose and His meaning in life. It was the example for all of us. Number three, that you will believe that the death of Jesus was necessary and its cost and accomplishment. The scripture says the wages of sin and every one of us have paid those, every one of us have those debts of sin and it's death. And there's a debt we cannot resolve, but the one, Jesus, who knew no sin became sin so we can become the righteousness of God. He paid a debt he did not owe so we could live a life we do not deserve. And last of all, I'm asking you to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. It's liberating and it's validating. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, if it was not for the resurrection, then the birth and the life and the death of Jesus would have been a waste. It would have all been in vain. The resurrection, folks, the resurrection is the guarantee that Jesus is who he said he was. Bruce Larson said it this way. He said, the events of Easter cannot be reduced to a creed or a philosophy we are not asked to believe the doctrine of the resurrection. We are asked to embrace the person who was raised from the dead. In faith, we move from belief in a doctrine to a relationship with a person. Ultimate truth is the one who said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. We meet Jesus because he is alive. There were a lot of responses to Christ that first Easter. Not much different than today. There's a lot of responses in here today. Some of the responses will be betrayal. Some of the responses will be out of fear. Some will be a, a cover-up. <laughs> By the way, real quick, we got to wrap this up. Most people think the first big cover-up was Watergate. Not true, it was Tombgate. Tombgate. I, I don't have the time to read to you, but you can read it for yourself. Matthew 27, Matthew 28. In, in the last part of chapter 27, the chief priests, they went to Pilate and said, hey, those friends of Jesus, they're going to sneak in and steal the body of Jesus and they're going to tell everybody he rose from the dead. We want you to put a guard on it. So they did. They put a guard, they put a stone, they put a seal on it. Chapter 28, rest of the story. Chapter 28, stone is rolled away. Jesus has walked out. The guards <laughs> don't know what happened. So the chief priests get together with the guards. Okay, this is a little part of the story people forget. They get with the guards and they say, okay, guards, here's what you do. We're going to give you some money. And we want you to tell everybody that the friends of Jesus came and stole his body. Do you see what happened? The chief priests did exactly what they didn't want the disciples to do. They told the lie. All right? And, and what did the guards do? They took the money and ran. Watergate, tomb gate. And, and, and there'll be some of you who will take the money and run. You'll take the brunch and run. And there are others who responded to Easter with joy, wonder, amazements, and repentance. Two thieves on a cross. Two very different choices. One thief said, if you are the one you say you are, if, no faith, if you are the one you say you are, get us out of here. All he wanted was immediate relief. He wanted no relationship. The other thief said, wait a minute, brother. You and I deserve what we're getting. This man has done nothing wrong. And Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. Heaven. What's your choice? Which thief will you identify with in life, in death, and eternity? The choice is yours. So if you're curious, would you become captivated today? If you are concerned, would you step into a trusting relationship with Jesus? If you're critical, crushed, or confused, would you with humility say, Lord, I need you and I want you, not just for heaven in the future, but Father, I want your Son, the Lord Jesus, in my life to make a difference in my world today. I'm looking for men and women who are willing to say, God, use me like you used apostles and women in the, in the first century and the history books say we turned a world upside down. Would you like to pray and invite him in your life? You're not, you're not sure why you came today, but you've been identified. You've been identified as curious George or confused Sally 
or critical Ethel, and if you have any one of those names, I'm sorry. <laughs> Crushed Orange, or Confused Willie, whatever it is, would you invite him in your life right now? That tingling of hope is running down your spine. That's God's conviction. Would you join with me in a prayer and invite him in your life right now? Lord Jesus, you know the men and women that have gathered here today for this day. You know why they've come. They may not have known until they got here, but now they've been identified. They've recognized that they were brought here for a divine appointment. They were brought here because they have ignored you, run from you, been mad at you for too long, and they're ready to say, okay, God, I'm yours. Father, the greatest sin that prevents people from going to the cross is not murder. It's not molesting children. It's not committing grand theft auto. Father, the greatest sin that keeps people from the cross is their own pride, their unwillingness to say, Lord, I am a sinner and I want you as my Savior. So, Father, for those who are breaking through the pride right now and they are running to you with prayer, Thank you that you were listening and you hear every one of them. There is a young man and there is a young woman whose life is going to be different because of today. There is an adult who's got young children who says, my family is going to be different than where we were headed. There are some senior citizens who are going to say, I'm not going to let the closing days of my life be a waste. If God could use Moses at 80, if God could use Abraham at 100, then he could use me where I am. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to do something before the choir sings our closing number. Guys, stay with me for just one more minute. Quite often in a service like this, we'll ask people to keep their heads bowed and eyes closed and don't look around. And We ask people to, hey, if you prayed that prayer, raise your hand. Nobody's going to bother you. Nobody's going to pest you. I'm going to make the last part of that promise. If you raise your hand, nobody's going to bother you. Nobody's going to pester you. Jesus died in humility on a cross so that he could offer to you and me forgiveness of sin, removal of condemnation, and a home in heaven. If you prayed today, if you did business with Jesus Christ, either to invite him into your life for the very first time, or you've been backslidden, you've been away from him, and you said, I'm gonna, this is a turning point for me in my life, or as a regular member, but God got a hold of your heart today and said, I'm ready to use you to make a difference, and I'm ready to let you use me to make a difference. If you prayed one of those kind of prayers, would you just raise your hand, put it right back down. Do not be ashamed. Amen. Anybody else? Someone else? You prayed a prayer and you said, God, I did business with you today. We had three in the first service. One over here. Anybody else? You just want to say, hey, I prayed. I'm one of those. The message was for. If not, the rest of you slept very, very quietly. Thank you very much. Oh, glorious day is the song we're going to go out on. Let's listen to the choir as they tell us how grand a day Easter Sunday was. <laughs>